with Ryan Reese from Southern California. This is Live with Ryan Reese. Post your questions using the hashtag LiveRyanReese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. We have a great show. I have one of my good friends, David Rosales, in studio from Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. How you doing, David? I'm good. It's good to okay, be with that's you. That's as corporate as it gets. <laughs> so... I wanted to get you on the show because you're a OG, original guy from the Calvary Chapel movement. Um, one of the yeah, one of the first guys that that actually launched out from from Chuck Smith that actually created uh, the movement of all the different churches that are now worldwide. And uh, it was birthed during the hippie movement. Mm-hmm. And your testimony. I mean, I've known you how long? I've, oh I've gosh, known you forever. I know. So you were a kid when I met you. Yeah, yeah. Known you and your family forever, and. Then uh, we got re uh, we we went to Israel and we ended up on a plane together. Mm-hmm. And after I got saved, I told you my story. Mm-hmm. But I just want to say out of the gates that God's used you and several other of the original uh, Calvary guys in my life um, that have that have come alongside me um, to encourage me in a in a very. I mean, I came from the world and I was also dropped into the church and I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. But I think because you guys, where you guys came from, and this is why I relate to you guys so much, is you guys came from a radical, you guys got saved radically at a radical time in history with uh, the whole uh, hippie movement stuff that was going on, that you guys understood where I was coming from. Mm-hmm. And it felt like the other like the other Calvary Chapel uh, pastors during that time, like the different generations, they didn't come, they, they came from a different era of the Calvary Chapel movement. Mm-hmm. So I think that's why you guys... You knew me, you saw me, and and I felt like we related in many in many ways. And just by taking chances on me, I mean, gosh, you guys took chances, and you still take chances, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I just want to, I just want to thank you for that. Oh, of course. Now you um, you weren't as different as you may have been feeling. Yeah. You know, as we were sharing a little bit earlier, the um, Calvary Chapel movement was was birthed from a, a radical time in American history. Yeah. You know, and so the things that you did, yeah, there was a notch up or maybe several notches above the things that the average hippie was doing at that time. You were yeah. more radical in many ways. Mm-hmm. But we saw the Lord um, do some fantastic things and some very radical people. So, no, when you got saved, your dad and I had spoken more than once, mm-hmm. and your mom had spoken to Marie and had mentioned to us, you know, keep Ryan in prayer, you know, which we did yeah. for over the years, you know. And when we think of you, we would pray for you. Yeah. And so for me, when you got saved, I was just like, I know your dad was so blessed, you know, and we, we were blessed along with him. But your radical lifestyle and all of that, yeah, that was kind of like um, something we came from, you yeah. know, because the hippie movement, when you, when you put it in context, the hippie, the hippie movement was extremely radical at a time when, um, when things were, I, I guess... If, that old saying, the first cut, cut is the deepest. When, they, when the hippies rebelled against the conservative establishment, mm-hmm. it was huge. I mean, if you had hair, your hair, for example, you mm-hmm. wouldn't have hair like that because guys would, would cut your hair off of you. They would actually take you and physically no cut way. your hair. Yeah. It was that crazy. Yeah, they would do that. And, um, you know, there were artists at that time that, that today we look at as being kind of like jokes almost or comedic in some mm-hmm. ways, like... Sonny and Cher, but Sonny, you know, Sonny Bono Mm -hmm. sang a song called Laugh At Me. That was on the radio because he had walked out of a a restaurant and he had hair. And his hair wasn't even that long, right? It it wasn't even at his his, his, Mm -hmm. his shoulders and uh, people were laughing at him. So he actually wrote a song that becomes somewhat of a hit, became a hit in the L.A. Southern California market. Uh, And it was called Laugh At Me. And he says, and I'll pray for you. You know, because they were laughing at the way he looked. His wife, uh, Cher, sang songs about uh, people laughing at him and, 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 and stuff. That was just mm-hmm. real common. Mm-hmm. And so when I started growing my hair, and a lot of the kids were doing it already, I was later into the scene than they. Um, what my year was dad, this? My, I was, my dad told me, you know, you grow your hair, you're out of my house. house. Yeah. Yeah, it was radical. So it was real radical. So, okay, so let's talk about this. What was, ha- before we get into your whole story, um, what was happening during this time? Like, there was there was a revolution happening in America, right? The free mm-hmm. the free love, which mm-hmm. was just um, free sex. Yeah. 
Um, there was the drug movement, which was the LSD and the, and the, and the marijuana at that time. Mm-hmm. I think you guys had some pills around, but it's more of that That's whole it. like um, psychedelic movement happening. Psych- yeah. mm-hmm. uh, what else? We, what, we, at war. We mm-hmm. were at war. Mm-hmm. And then what else was going on during that well, time? You know, during was racism that day, happening? Racism always was. Yeah, racism. But here in Southern California, it wasn't as pronounced. It wasn't spoken about as much. Yeah. We'd read about it in the South where churches got bombed and babies got killed. But here in Southern California, our racism was more masked. It was more like, nah, you know, that's someplace else. Yeah. But I never spoke to an African-American until I was on a bus on my way to Fort Ord. And I was 20 years old. I had Whoa. never spoken to a black person in my life. You know, and so, no, it was it was there, but it wasn't as apparent. It wasn't as real. It's been said that the Southern racism was genuine and real because at least uh, the those who were racist would speak to the blacks and say, I hate you. It was the Northern racism that was more dangerous. You know, Martin Luther King said that he would never encountered anything as racist as Detroit. And that's the North because he says because people would say, because uh, people will say we love the black man when in fact they hated him and just masked it with pretend love. Wow. See, so that was real during mm-hmm. that day. So there were some thing, many things that changed. I mean, starting real early and moving very quickly to kind of what led to the Jesus movement as I see it mm-hmm. and remember it is you actually, I think much of the movement that led to, to the hippies and things was really founded in music. It really was music. What was, so what was the mind state like? Where were the kids at in their head? What 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 were they so attracted to? What were they trying to accomplish? What was missing? What created this this movement? What were the lyrics? What were they searching for? I'd say the the same thing every generation looks for love. Love. And we were looking for a relationship. We were looking for for real something that's mm-hmm. that's that's not phony. We used to call it plastic. We were looking for something that authentic. was real, something yeah. authentic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The church at that time yeah, what were they doing? <laughs> well, the church at that time looked at the hippies as a threat and looked at the hippies as being just uh, worthless. Even Chuck Smith himself would say that, and he did, Yeah, how that the hippies were just lazy and they ought to get jobs. And it was really Kay Smith who would uh, sit there and watch the hippie kids walk past her, the beach kids at Huntington by the pier, and she would be there on Main Street, and she would see the hippie kids walk by, and she... She would cry while Chuck would say, those kids are dirty. I ought to take a bath, cut their hair, you know, put on some shoes. It was Kay. And Chuck would say this. It was Kay who would cry for him. And it was Kay's tears and her prayers that actually made Chuck begin to think something's got to be done for these kids. In the church at that time, now, like electric guitars and all that, that was like from the devil, right? <laughs> yeah, and drums? Never, it was called voodoo music. Voodoo music. It if you voodoo. had electric guitars and drums. The drums. The because drum. they said, oh, the drums. Because the drum circles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they said the drums were jungle beat, and it would drive you into an emotional frenzy. Oh, boy. So they banned them. I mean, we, we rented a church that would not allow us to, and this is, we're talking about the 80s. Yeah. We, we, we were not allowed to bring uh, uh, drums or guitars into the sanctuary. We could have it in the fellowship hall. But you couldn't have them in the sanctuary. So how did they how they were singing like hymns on like, like with well the, pianos it was, or what was it? They back, were it was a Seventh Day Adventist yeah. church. This is back in seventies yeah. actually. But uh, yeah, but we 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 brought in the guitars and yeah. things and all eventually. But no, they said that that was yeah. dishonoring to God, and that was a typical. There that was not unusual. Yeah. No. So that's so now you have all these kids that are. That are listening to rock music. I mean, mm-hmm. I just saw. Um, I've watched several. Um, I've always been attracted to and uh, been into like the psychedelic uh, music from that era. Ever mm-hmm. since I was in like high school, I got into it, and it's mm-hmm. been ever since. Mm-hmm. Um, so I always watch the old like the Grateful Dead documentary on <laughs> on um, on Netflix. Mm-hmm. They did a, an incredible uh, document. It's like I think like ten films of of how that whole thing birthed the Wall of Sound and all that. Then the Jimi Hendrix, mm-hmm. the Doors, yeah, yeah. and then they did one on Woodstock recently. Mm-hmm which is incredible but um you have all these kids that are that are into this music and stuff mm-hmm. and so they're they're so far from church the church is against them they're against the church mm-hmm. and that's kind of where you were at in your life at that mm-hmm. point so what um as you grew up during this era how did you even find God or get introduced to this being caught up in all this noise yeah I was raised my my mom was was uh, 19 just a month short of 20 when she she had me Mm -hmm. she already had my brother when she was 18 and so mama would play music in the house constantly I grew up with all the old rock all of it because Mm -hmm. my mom was a kid 
you know, so I grew up, and I still remember the original cuts of Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee Lewis, and you name it, I remember it, because that was my mom, and my mom was a dancer. My mom loved to dance and all, mm -hmm. and so I grew up in the environment of music and, yeah. and all of that, so that always had kind of like a, a, a draw to me, so I always liked it, but the church, you know, I was raised in the Catholic Church, and the church didn't allow any modern music of any sort, you know, mm -hmm. so it was boring for me, the homilies or the preaching was boring to me none of that connected so like for the listeners that are listening that are that are they're catholic what what's what's what was the difference that you see now between like catholicism back then to a, a relationship with god now well there's a huge difference and i'll give i'll give you a quick quick example okay because really quick because i i run into a lot of catholics and they don't they don't never heard they've heard of the holy spirit but they never knew about the connection mm -hmm. they don't know how that operates mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was raised in the Catholic Church. I was baptized when I was a few months old. I received my my uh, they call it the sacrament of penance and communion and confirmation. So I, there's seven seven sacrament, sacraments in the Catholic Church. I received four of them, and so that was all your basic stuff. So I, I was raised being catech in a catechism. I knew the basic. I still do. Marie, my wife, and I were just talking last night. We were watching a show and. And they had a Catholic theme in the background, and I turned to her and I said, oh, and I explained something to her about it. And she says, oh, yeah, I remember. We were both raised in the Catholic mm -hmm. Church. So what's the difference? Well, when my friend, I have a friend who started going to church, to Calvary Chapel, he wanted to argue with me about God. So I went to a priest, my parish priest, and I sat down, had a meeting with him, and I said, listen, I've got a Protestant telling me about God, telling me about Jesus and, and, and being saved and all, and I want some answers. I want to be able to debate him. I said, because I'm a Catholic. I said, and I, and I think the Catholic Church is the true church and everything I've been taught, I believe, but I don't have any answers for him. And I'll never forget this, Ryan. He, he leans back and he kind of folds his arms and he says, well, I tried Eastern religion. I tried various other things. He said, I came back to the Catholic Church, and so will you. That was his answer. And so when I walked out of that room, you know, I was a dumb kid. I was 19. But when I walked out of that room, I said to myself, he didn't know. He, he didn't know. know what the truth is. Yeah. And, I, and that was so, I mean, he had no passion. He had no sense. He had no answers. He had nothing. And so I can't speak for the average Catholic, but yep. I can speak for myself. I can say that when I went to church, there was no gospel. I could say that I sat next to people that had no love. I can say that I took an, a, an oath when I was eight years old in church. The priest had to stand up and say, if you don't want to drink and never will drink, um, you know, stand up and I'll pray for you. And I was a little boy. I stood up because I wanted to live for God. Yeah. And I stood up and the priest kept on looking, trying to talk me out of standing up because I was so little. But I'll tell you, Ryan, the first beer I ever had in my life was in the Catholic Church, and I was eight years old. We broke into a, a refrigerator, <laughs> and we stole the beer they were going to have for their fiesta, for their festival. Yeah. So the same <laughs> church that was telling us, take an oath not yeah. to drink, sold us the beer within two or three months after that, right? I cannot believe So I saw that. Yeah. I saw those things. You know, you're eight years old. You're not stupid. I mean, yeah, you, yeah, you, you perceive. Know what's going you on. see things. Yeah. And I, I began to see the Catholic people I knew who would would say Catholic things, but God things, oh, I'm blessed by God, but their lives didn't line up with what a good life was. And that was my early upbringing. So by the time I was 15, that's when I started the alcohol and drugs. When I got into that age, I, I just stepped away from any of the faith that I used to have. Yeah, because it wasn't adding up. And that, that's the thing with that when I go to these high schools, I'm always constantly, and wherever I tour in the world, I'm always cutting through religion and relationship mm -hmm. because when most people think about God or Jesus or Christianity or any kind of religion, they think of like all these rules and regulations. And that's, you know, when you're a Catholic and you know, you're, you're, you, they go out and live like hell all week and then they just go and confess and go right back to that old life. There's no transformation. Mm -hmm. And I t tell these kids, I'm like, guys, this is about a relationship, you know, it's not about a bunch of rules and regulations, but when you invite Jesus Christ into your life, the difference between relationship is God sends the power from heaven, the Holy Spirit, he fills you. And then the Bible says that he makes the, all the old things in your life pass away and everything become brand new. Mm -hmm. Outwardly, you're still the same. You don't change outside. Mm -hmm. uh, God does a work inside of you. And mm -hmm. because you have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you, things start changing mm -hmm. and you start sinning a lot less and God starts cleaning up your life, but you're still... The Ryan Reese, you're still the David Rosales. You're, you're still into the same things, music and art and, mm -hmm. you know, sports or whatever it is. That stuff doesn't change. Mm -hmm.
but it's more of like the inward work and and it's not a bunch of rules and regulations because I think that's the biggest turnoff even from just from religion to the the common folks is they they don't want all these to be like when I gave my life to God if you would have said Ryan you need to stop watching porn you need to stop smoking cigarettes you need to stop you know all these things in my life I would have been like dude I can't do it mm. but the work of the Holy Spirit I stopped cussing immediately you know for for the most part mm. um then uh the porn uh went away like it, i got to a place in my life where i was just like okay dude i don't want to be a poser i don't want to be like a double-minded man i don't want to watch porn and go to church back and forth mm. so the holy spirit holy spirit took that out of my life after six months and then the cigarettes stopped after like a year you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. it was a process mm -hmm. but it's not a bunch of like okay you need to stop everything right now. Mm -hmm. It was just more like fall in love with Jesus and let him do that. And that's the difference between rules and regulations, religion, Absolutely. and a relationship. Absolutely. Well, you know, when I've, when I've taught at the church about marriage <clears throat> and um, the question, and I've said, you know, why don't I commit adultery? Because I have plenty, I've had in the past plenty of opportunity. Why don't I? He says, because the Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery. The reason I don't commit adultery mm -hmm. is a simple one. I'm in love with my wife. Yes. When I'm in love with my wife, that keeps me from doing the things that I've been forbidden to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I, I really believe that what you just said is, is, is right on because, um, yeah, there are some things the Word says, do not do this. And, and because you may not understand it, you obey it because it's said not to. You yeah. obey it. But over time, you come to realize that these things were given for a blessing and not a curse. And you begin to realize, wow, God said don't do that because it would hurt me. I didn't know it at that time because I longed to do that because I found pleasure in it. But I've discovered that by not doing that, my life is better. And, and that's how it is. It's just, yeah, obedience is out of love. It always has been. And as a Christian, when I got saved, I knew a lot of the stuff. My, 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 my vocabulary was horrible. I, 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 one of my coaches said that I was the quickest runner in high school, in our high school because I was on the track. I was the quickest runner in high school but had the filthiest mouth he'd ever heard. You know, and when I got saved, I actually invented word combinations just to blow his mind. I actually did. I really did that. So when I got saved, one of my friends, Bill, told me this. He said, Dave, he says, I know you're saved. And I said, how would you know something like that? How do you know? Yeah. He says, you don't cuss <clears throat> anymore. You don't cuss anymore. You don't cuss anymore. And he was right. I hadn't even thought about it because the Lord had given me a new language. And those were the things that I, they did. They went away. But like you said, there are other things that are like besetting sins, habits, things that you've done, never really thought about. Yeah. You know, and over time you start saying, mm, I don't feel good when I do this. And then you discover, well, that's because it's wrong to do. Because mm -hmm. you don't know the whole Bible the day you get saved. You just know that you're saved. Mm -hmm. And that's where the word comes in. That's where the cleansing, the washing of the word comes mm -hmm. in. That's where you get convicted because God says not to do this. And then you say, God, are you sure? And because, of course, he is. You're just not wanting to give it up. But over time, you start realizing his word is sure. And it does change lives. And I want to be an example. And people do look at me as a model. I've given my test. That's kind of how it works, you mm -hmm. know. And I did the same kind of thing. I think it's just basically what we do. Yeah, 100%. Um, with that, with that, okay, so <clears throat> I forgot we were, where we were going before we got into that. Who knows? <laughs> okay, so, well, that was for basically the difference between religion and relationship. So now you, as you're growing up as a Catholic, um, how do you find, how do you end up finding God? Because your friend's talking to you about, mm. Yeah. About Christianity. Yeah. And you're talking to the priest. Yeah. And then the priest basically is like, he, he doesn't have a clue because he obviously doesn't have a relationship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, with God. So what to, what was the next step to find? Well, my friend began to um, invite me to go to Calvary Chapel. And I had been going around with a young lady at that time that I was, I felt that I was in love with. Marie has since convinced me I wasn't. But, you know, at that time, I was pretty sure I was. And I, I was a... Uh, I was a rotten person, you know. I wasn't yeah. good in relationship at all. It was all about me and what I wanted and stuff, and so I wasn't good, a good person. So I, I hurt her, and I felt bad about it. For the first time, I really felt bad about hurting another person, and so I said, something's wrong with me. I've got to change. Something's, mm -hmm. And I started doing kind of crazy things. The pattern started erupting because when I was 18, I had, or, yeah, 18, I had broken up with a girl, and I went and burglarized a jewelry store. I got arrested for doing that. Well, after I broke up with this girl, I started doing the same wild kinds of things. They stopped eating, started just, you know, downing drugs. They dropped, like, 
30 pounds in a month because I stopped eating. And I was already wow. skinny. I, I was already skinny. I what, went, what was going on? What, what were the drugs you were doing? Were you liking well, the like uppers or downers? Uh, or no, I hated uppers because <laughs> I couldn't sleep and I yeah. liked to sleep. I hated yeah. them, you know. But I smoked a lot of pot, drank a lot of beer, and, so, and I, I dropped magic mushroom, things yeah. like that. Just yeah. those kinds of things that were. Because remember at that time, right, this will kind of blow some of your audience who's more <laughs> conversant in this. <clears throat> but acid at that time was $10 a hit. Ten bucks. Ten dollars a hit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you could buy, you could buy a can. You could buy a lid. You know, um, I don't know what it's called today. Was it, is it on paper or liquid? Or how were you guys? Getting it would it back be then? both. Okay. You know, we'd had pills. You know, sometimes they would, and they'd give us an aspirin that was soaked in. I mean, no there are way. different that's ways a, that you could get it. That's crazy. Yeah, and we'd smoke a lot of pot. Yeah. And so I started moving into reds, a little reds. You know, what were those downers? Uh, second all. Um, yeah. Lil, Lily F40, I'll speak to the older audience right now. They were, they're downers. downers. They're downers. So I started doing those kinds of things. But I started doing a lot of drinking and smoking pot. That began yeah. to be what I liked to do. It was easier to do. It's, 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 you know, you could yeah. get it a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I was in. I couldn't afford $10 for a tab of acid, you know. So $10 back then would have been like how much? Today? I don't know what it goes for now, but well, acid, 10 bucks at that time. Bucks. I don't know. But 10 bucks is a lot of money back then. Yeah, it was. You know, it, that's probably 100 bucks or more. That's you know? crazy. Yeah, it was a lot. You could wow. buy a half gallon of wine for $1.69. I know that because I did it every Friday. <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's how I started my Friday nights with a half gallon of wine and yeah. a quart of beer. That's how I started, and then it just rolled to the rest of the night. Yeah, that's what we did. Okay, so. So I got invited by a friend of mine to go to Calvary Chapel. Mm -hmm. And that's when I told him, listen, you know, because he, he'd been asking me. And I said, I don't want to go to your church. How did he get you there? Well, insistent. He just continued to ask. And so I was in a garage across the street from my house, smoking pot, drinking beer. And he came and picked me up and I went to church. The first time I went to Calvary Chapel, I went in barefooted, you know, a little high, you know, alcohol on my breath. Yeah. And I expected to get kicked out because at the Catholic Church, you couldn't even walk in barefooted. I mean, there's no way. Yeah, there's no way. I'd have been escorted out. There... There were, uh, it was a place that sat two, three hundred people, every seat taken at that time. It was a little chapel. Okay, so this was the, during the little this chapel. Was this was in uh, the summer of 1970. Okay. So it was a little chapel there. Every seat was taken. The aisles were filled with kids, even around the platform. And I remember walking in and sitting in the very back because we were a little late. Everybody would come early. And I was sitting in the back, and as I was sitting back there, they started to have music. Again, I love music, and they began to sing a, a song that I that, that used to be a big hit in the early 60s called Someone Really Loves You, Guess Who? I still remember the song. So they're just playing like secular music? Well, what this is what they did. They said, somebody really loves you, guess who? And then he goes on, open up your heart, and this and that. And he's, he says that someone is Jesus. So they sing the secular song. Yeah, and but they, they added someone, Jesus yeah. to it. And I and I kicked back, and I, That's and, cool. and I said, man, I, I, I've never been around a song that talks about Jesus as a song that I like. And that's what introduced me. But I've shared this really quickly. I, I've shared this is my first experience at a Calvary Chapel. And I tell pastors, we need this in our churches. Yeah. The very first thing that I felt in that room that I did not know what it was, Ryan, and I'd gone to church on and off all my life. I didn't know what it was until I got saved. And then I said, so it was love. It wasn't the world's love. We were hippies. Remember, all the world needs is love. You yeah. know, love is all we need. But I never had felt it. And when I walked in there and I sat in there, I sensed something different about these people. I was accepted. I didn't feel I had to be the most radical or entertaining or whatever. Yeah. I just was there. And I, I sat there basking in something. I didn't know what it was until three months later, when I got saved, and that's when the light went off, and said, "What you were?" Because I went to the Hollywood Palladium. That's how I got saved. There was a what they used to call Maranatha concert. Four thousand kids at the Palladium. Oh, at the, the Palladium. Hollywood Palladium. Palladium. Yeah, and they had this big old. There Whoa. were about four thousand kids sitting on the carpet. Yeah. And Arthur Blessed gave a message. You remember Arthur carried he, the the cross guy carried a cross. Yeah. Yeah. Arthur gave a message, and he said, um, "If you need Jesus, stand to your feet." And by that time, I knew I needed Jesus. I'd heard the gospel. They'd been singing music and, about him. And I remember sitting there with all these hippies. There were thousands of hippies sitting there. And I remember sitting there saying, God, I need you. I know I need you. 
and 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 this is something the spirit said he said i said god i'm uncomfortable and i heard the voice of the lord in my heart say why and then i confessed and i said because i'm not like these people and the voice said what is different in my heart and i said I'm not a Christian. That's the first time I ever admitted, even to myself, yeah. that I wasn't a Christian. I heard his voice. Why? I said, I'm not a Christian. And then when Arthur Blessed got up and shared, he said, if you need Christ, stand to your feet. I prayed again. And I said, God, I said, I need you. I know I do, but I'm shy. I can't stand in front of anybody. Yeah. But if somebody stood with me, I would. And Arthur Blessed said, and this God is my witness, <laughs> Arthur Blessed said, perhaps you're afraid to stand by yourself, but if someone stood with you, would you? And my friend George tapped me on the shoulder and said, I'll stand with you. No That's how way. I got, that's that how I got awesome. saved. Yeah. Some music, and we just would sing or have them sing to us. Then Lonnie would come out, and he'd open up his Bible, and he'd stand there holding it, and no notes or anything. He'd just kind of quote from it and talk and then give an invitation and that's that was our general thing it, so it was pretty basic just very basic read the very, Bible. very much like ours is right now yeah. we, we add this and we add that but yeah that was that's what we did yeah hmm. it and wasn't then, formal at all and we're, we're a bunch of people getting saved oh at this man every uh, all the time all the time every invitation kids were getting up and just flooding yeah so it was more like people would get saved and then they would invite their friends over yeah oh yeah so it was oh, like yeah. that kind of effect where a lot of people yeah. they, they, that doesn't happen these days like people bring in their, their friends. They're not, they're not bringing Jesus to the people, Ryan, and you are, but they're not. Yeah. They're, they're bringing their church to the people. They're bringing their activities to the people. Yeah. They're bringing the political persuasion to the people, but they're not bringing Jesus to the people. The people didn't come to politics. They, di they didn't come for just the prophecy. They came for Jesus. They came for Jesus. And that's what the key is. As long as he saw, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men into myself. Boom, yes. That's the key. Yep. Keep him Jesus. the center of everything. Amen. And that's, the, again, that's the Jesus movement. It was all about Jesus. Everything. Jesus music, Jesus people, you know, Jesus, the, the Jesus movement. It was Jesus. It's, that's We didn't get caught up with the Calvary Chapel movement. Yeah. Right? It was the Jesus movement. Yes. And it's Jesus before Calvary Chapel. All right. Well, when we come back from the break, I want to talk more about this Jesus people movement. Listeners, if you guys want to get uh, all the past radio shows, go to the app, the Whosoever's app, download them. We have like three years or more of past shows on every subject possible um, on there too if you want to book a kill the noise tour in the high schools you could get all the information there we basically travel all around the world we go into the public school system um, junior highs high schools we've done some universities and colleges as well um, and we bring the gospel message we work with the bible clubs that's our inroads to the schools it's through the bible clubs, so we could talk about whatever we want uh, the lgbt they have their about uh, they have their clubs the satanists have their clubs the Christians have their clubs. It's legal for all of us in the United States to have Bible clubs. So if you don't have one in your church, I would suggest start one because literally you could have church on campus. I talk to people that have 300 kids per week on campus. We'll talk to you guys right after the break. Peace. Students today face many more distractions and problems than ever before. Drug abuse, depression, Broken families, self-harm, suicide are just a few of the issues they have to overcome. A 15-year-old living today gathers as much information in one day as a 15-year-old would gather 80 years ago in one year. 23% of male students in high school and 37% of female students in high school struggle with depression. On our school tours, we've encountered a sense of hopelessness because of the rise of suicide, substance abuse, depression, and anxiety. The Whosoever's mission is to deliver a message of truth of the gospel to the students and empower them to realize their true purpose in life. Our Kill the Noise school tour reaches out to them with a message of hope. It's a free event we provide to the schools, which includes a speaker with an inspiring message, the Gideon's Book of Life, product giveaways, and free food. How can you partner with us? Join our monthly giving program, give a one-time donation, or purchase our products. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I love what Jesus says. The harvest is ripe, the workers are few. 
More live with Ryan Reese coming up. Everything all right? Yeah. Call now. 1-888-564-6173. Or post your questions using the hashtag LiveRyanReese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Uh, I think I speak for the entire administration when I say... Now, back to live with Ryan Reese. Don't say it when I warn you. Loud noises! A lot of, right before the break, you were talking about how a lot of churches are coming up with these programs for people and all this stuff, and I think we need to just get back to the roots of Jesus. Amen. And the attraction of the message is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world, and everyone knows even the schools I go to, even back when you were, you know, in the 70s or whatever, that mm. were dirty sinners. Everyone's a sinner. Mm. And that is the attraction. I think a lot of churches and people try to come up with like these um, motivational messages that doesn't have anything about the cross, anything about sins and mm. these programs. But the attraction and the power is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Amen. This is what we need. Amen. People get scared like, oh, you know, I don't know if I want to call them sinners or I don't want to talk about the blood on the cross that was shed. That is the good news. Mm -hmm. And if we could just get back to Jesus and that's, I'm a cross guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not like a amazing Bible teacher or anything, but I'm a cross guy. And this, when I go into the schools, as I'm preaching, I tell them, you guys are a bunch of dirty sinners. And this is why Jesus died on the cross Mm -hmm. for the forgiveness of our sins. And they're like, I want that. Mm -hmm. And then the icing on top is the eternal life. You get Mm -hmm. to live forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the good news. Mm -hmm. And what you guys were doing back in the hippie movement. I mean, I want you to talk more about this. You were, you were at Calvary chapel when it first started, or this was about 1970. You're in a chapel, which only hold like 300 people. You You said that they had, um, uh, rock and roll music uh, for that time, which was insane because that stuff was literally from the devil, the voodoo yeah, drums and the yeah, guitars. Yeah. And then you had Lonnie Frisbee uh, uh, speaking. Mm-hmm. So tell me, let's let's talk about what was happening uh, during this time because there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit during this time. So what, from your perspective, what were you seeing that was happening back then to where uh, maybe the difference to where we're at now? You know, I think that with the preaching of the cross and, and what you're saying right now, Ryan, with the preaching of the cross and and the honest statement that we're lost and we are sinners and by nature we're evil, that wasn't hidden. That wasn't something that was not politically correct. That's what the church was supposed to be saying at that time. Yeah. So for me, you know, there is a natural offense. There's an offense that you take because 
the the preaching of the cross is offensive. It, it there's a certain cutting to it, and and so. But on the on the on the other hand, I mean, it's the only way you can be healed. I mean, a surgeon's scalpel is intended to cut, but it removes from you that which is killing you. So you you can't expect to not experience a little pain when something evil is removed. And I think when the when the cross is preached and, and we see ourselves for who we are and what we've done and our responsibility for the death of Christ, when we actually see that through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, it's supposed to produce humility in you. Mm-hmm. And, and because I'm, I, I, I'm wrong, you know, in, in the in Catholic Church, we would hit our chest at a certain point in the Mass and we'd say, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. In the Latin, my fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. That's what we were taught. We were taught to remember that we were the ones Jesus died for. So within the Catholic Church, mm-hmm. that is something I still treasure and remember. Because awesome, yeah. it was a mea culpa. It was something I did. See, so when we got saved, we were, nobody was, was, was hiding the fact. I mean, your friends will tell you what you are. Mm-hmm. My friends were getting saved, so my friends would say, you're a doper, man. You, you're a drunk, man. You're rebellious. You're a thief. You're a liar. Yeah. You know, and they were right. Who is going to argue with a friend who knows you? I want to add something. And I think it's also in the delivery, the way we give it. Because if you're, if you're telling someone, because yeah, yeah. they're the repentance of the cross and that we're sinners, you say it, like when I say I'm saying it lovingly to mm-hmm, people, I'm like, mm-hmm. dude, you guys are all dirty sinners like me. That's right. And that's what the good news is, that's is that he key. died on the cross. That's the key. And, and it's the delivery in because you love people. That's right. And you're telling them, hey, dude, that's right. you're screwed up. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm telling you because I love you because there's a way out of this stuff. Amen. You know, Paul made the statement. He said, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and yet he also said to the Ephesians, we speak the truth. In love. In love, And yep. so that's the key, you know. So, yeah, your friends can be real with you because they're your friends. That's what makes and them you your know friends, that, yeah. right? And, yeah. You know, so you know they love you, at least the way friends love one another and all. So that's what they were doing to me. They would say, you know, Dave, you know, you, you need God. And me, I'd rebel against it. But that was the heart of it. That <laughs> yeah. was the heart of the Jesus movement. So we, we were not invited to church. You know, we were invited to come with them. But it, oh, it wasn't come to my church. Yeah. It was come and... And, and hear a man who told me all that I've ever done. Can this be Messiah? Like the woman at the well. Mm-hmm. So they'd say, come in here. And that's what got me to go. I, I thought I'd get them off my back mm-hmm. if I showed up once. I expected to get kicked out because I was barefooted and a little high. Yeah, yeah. The opposite was true. I was welcomed in because sinners have a tendency of being okay with other sinners, especially yeah. when they're freshly saved. Now, who am I to judge you, man? Mm-hmm. We both need the same God. Yeah. And that was the attitude within the Jesus movement that was prevalent. So so Chuck Smith, during that time, he was doing like the Sunday mornings. You guys had like these, uh, these young meetings mm-hmm. on Monday nights with Lonnie Frisbee. And he he was like the evangelist back then during yeah, that time yeah. for, mm-hmm. for the hippies. Like mm-hmm. he, he's a hippie that got saved that was reaching the yes. hippies. Which was awesome because it was like the same tribe. He identified with them. They yeah. identified with them. Yeah. And then there was a work of the Holy Spirit that was happening back then. Mm. Like, I mean, there was a middle of a revival. Now, did this revival, because when you look at revival, you're like, oh, yeah, the revi- they were in the middle of a revival. But there's like birth pains to the revival. Mm. How was that? It started like on the school campuses, started in the streets, and then the church started filling and then did you see the presence of God increase with the signs and wonders and everything that were happening? I mean, all of that was natural. It was it was how that it all... was very natural for us. I mean, you read your Bible and the Bible says these things take place and therefore they must. You yeah. know, if you believe the Bible, you know, well, the, the Bible says that God loves me, he must. If God, the Bible says Jesus died for me, he must have. If mm-hmm. Jesus says you can come to me and be saved, that's true. Mm-hmm. And that was how we looked at it. You know, our faith was innocent and fresh. Yeah. And so why wouldn't I believe what the Bible said? There wasn't yeah. this huge atheistic movement against the truth of Scripture. Yeah. I didn't grow up in a time when the Bible was mocked. Yeah. I didn't grow up in a time when, when people would parade against it or it was forbidden in schools. We didn't grow up in that, mm-hmm. in that era, Ryan. Mm-hmm. We, we were given permission to be believers and expected to be. It's been said that the 50s, the, in the 50s, decade of the 50s, more people went to hell than any other time in the history of the United States. And possibly there can be some truth to that because they were overall good people. You know, s- uh, stores were closed on Sundays. People, I grew up in this way. There were no stores open on Sundays. You stayed home. You ate Sunday dinner. You ate it after going to church. That was very normal. Wow. See, so our, our, the norm 
that we grew up with. It, there, there were no swear words. There were uh, you didn't see anything on TV that was wrong. I mean, Ricky Ricardo and Lucy, you know, on the yeah, I yeah. Love Lucy, yeah. they didn't even sleep in the same bed. And yet they had little Ricky, and, and we, we know we can figure out how that happened because they didn't even sleep in the same bed. I mean, it was an entirely different time. What the heck? i got to watch that show. Think man. about it. It was, <laughs> a, it was an entirely different time. That's insane. Entirely. I was sharing just last night that even in the 60s, how um, Elvis Presley, they would not show him on TV on the Ed Sullivan show uh, other than a waist uh, no way because he, he yeah because he's the shake he, he gyrated shake, shake right <laughs> you know they told the rolling stones you can't sing let's spend the night together they had to sing let's spend some time together oh my god the gosh. doors could not sing you know uh, he got banned i saw that video oh, well because yeah, he, he, did he, he did what he wasn't <laughs> supposed to do and he got banned that was my generation wow and so because of that That's crazy because of that there were people like you and me who were growing up saying that's just not real that's not what's really going on. Yeah, that wasn't authentic. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a real deal. That's not real. This is nonsense. It's sh- sugar-coated. Yep. Yeah. And so we rebelled against the hypocrisy. Yeah. You yep. know, in my, in my school, in my school, our, our school president, Bob Vieira, his name was, in my senior year, stood up and he said, Sierra High School, which is where I went to in Whittier, Sierra High School is the number one drug um, school with drug problems in the Whittier Union High School District. And we started cheering, all of us who used to do the drugs, and there weren't that many. But we started going, yeah, we're number one. That was our attitude. Yeah. We were rebels about, and we really were. Today's rebel uh, that we have has a different feel to him. Today's is it's easier to be Antifa. It's easier to be angry. Shut up, you can't. We weren't quite like that. We were, we were mellow. Hippies were more mellow. You'd say, I don't believe this. And I'd look at you and I'd say, well, I don't care. Yeah. I, I don't care. Yeah. Because we were apathetic in some things. The thing that mattered was getting along. It, it, whatever you do, as long as it doesn't harm anybody else, it's cool. Just keep it to yourself and don't push your stuff on me. That's how we were. Mm-hmm. So we were looking, I think, as a generation. It's been said we were a generation lost in space. We were, we were a group of people, and it was huge that had an undercurrent of rejecting things as they are. And we knew we needed something better. Well, that's where Jesus came in. Right. Because we were looking for the true hippie, mm-hmm. you know, and, and he, he, he wore sandals, he had long hair, he had a beard. That's true. He was the true hippie. And so we discovered his message of love. And it was a love of Christ, but it was also a message of holiness and, and you don't need the dope anymore, and you don't need the promiscuity anymore. You don't need any of that. Those things were temporary, and they destroy. What you need is purity, and that message started seeping into us, and we saw the reason for it. Many of my friends and I did, and that's how that happened. Mm-hmm. And so we said, you know what I need? I need to celebrate who God is. And when it comes to the Holy Spirit, Chuck, Chuck taught us, and Lonnie would do, the same, you know what, just expect God to move. Mm-hmm. Chuck Chuck taught us, especially it came to be true in my pastoral ministry, where he where he would teach us, and he did, and he exampled. He said, "You know, God can do anything, anything that is within His will. He does. Mm-hmm. You just need to trust Him to do things that are abundantly above all you could ask or even think." Mm-hmm. And he taught us that, and and that's the heart of the Calvary movement to this day. We knew that when we took a drug, forty minutes from now or so, we're going to start coming on. We used to call it coming on. I don't mm-hmm. know what they call it now. In, in 40 minutes, we're going to come on to the drug. We're, if I drop acid, within 40 minutes, I've digested it, and I'm going to start hallucinating. Yeah. If I, I'm drinking, it's going to take a few beers, but eventually I'm going to get yeah. a little... It was just a cause and effect. Yeah, yeah. So when I got saved, I thought, well, if I take a drug and I get high, and it was just real practical, I thought, if I ask God to move and answer a prayer... He will. Why wouldn't he? Yeah. So it was really an that, innocence that to that childlike it. faith. Yeah. I think that's what we got to get back to. Yeah. Is I, yeah. I, I, when I when I got saved, I had that. I, I I have that childlike faith still. And like when I got saved, I just remember opening the Bible and I was just like, okay, the Bible says this, so that could happen. Mm-hmm. And then I just started as I read it. I'd just be like, oh, cool. So God, Jesus prayed for these guys that they got healed. I'm like, mm-hmm. cool. So like God. 
when I pray for people, like I'm expecting people to get healed. Mm -hmm. And I know obviously it's all according to his will, mm -hmm. you know, as it is on earth, as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. So it's whatever he wants to do. But I, I'm like, okay, you could cast demons out of people. You could pray for people to see, uh, you know, uh, people to be healed of whatever's going on. So that's how I've just kind of read that face value. And as I started reading about the disciples and, and um, even Paul and these guys, I was just like, dude, like what I see, I want to live. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I don't think, I know that's where the relationship with God is so exciting mm -hmm. because that's the difference again between religion and relationship. When you actually read the Bible and you don't look at like a bunch of rules or regulations, but it's more like you get inspired and you're like, I want to live this radical life and mm -hmm. it's a journey and it's exciting. Mm -hmm. And when God starts moving in your life, you know, like once he starts moving things around and doing things and answering prayers and you just want more and more and more, it's like, You've, you just become like, you just want more of his, his presence and, and, and his relationship. And, and as you read the Bible, it's his words and he speaks to you and you just grow. And, and I, I would never turn back. There's just no turning back mm -hmm. for me. Amen. And that's, I think that's what happened in, in the movement is you guys just started reading the Bible for face value and just expecting. And, mm -hmm. and that was the birth of the movement mm -hmm. today. You know, one of the things that I believe very strongly is that um, the, 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 they say the historians who chronicle things like this say that the Jesus movement as it was mm -hmm. uh, lasted until around 1976, maybe 77 at the latest. And they still So wait, say but that. when did it start? It like, started really, 60, 60? probably 60, well, Chuck took over um, Costa Mesa around 65 or so, Santa Ana, Costa Mesa, Calvary Chapel. But the hippies began to show up around 67, 68. Okay. That's when they started trickling in. It's like 10 years. So by 1970, it was f starting to really yeah. explode. So yeah, yeah. at that time. And then around 76, some church historians say that the, that the movement had hit its peak and began. Well, I'll tell you what I think happened. There's well, a couple yeah, of things. Happened? One is uh, Pentecostal excess. You know, Calvary chapels are, we are charismatic churches. Mm -hmm. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, that God does healings and he moves, gives prophecies, and we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe that. Mm -hmm. But what happened is TBN and other stations began, especially TBN, began to broadcast right around that time. And they were bringing in these excessive Pentecostals who were saying nonsensical things. I have to be real about that. Oh, okay, That's what it. they were doing. They were bringing in nonsense. They brought in the, the false teachers, the ones who were hyper-Pentecostal. And so instead of preaching the gospel, yeah. they began to give testimony of how, how they have you know, floated off of platforms of the Holy Spirit, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But you've seen in your lifetime where they started saying, you know, you know, gold dust falling from the ground. That all started in in the mid-70s. And so that was one of the things where the excesses and getting away from the Word and only going to testimony, you know, oh, God, this, and then making outlandish claims about how important you are and, and all yeah. of that, you know, you never get sick and you're always going to be prosperous. Yeah, all of that, all that infiltrated. Stuff yeah. And so the world that was really impressive, and you have to think of it like this, right? If you go back, and I know you love music, you go back and look at the music from the late 60s, We'll, we'll talk 69, 70, yeah. into the early 70s. And you had secular artists who were singing Christian songs, even songs that weren't Christian but sounded like it. It's true. You know, and, it's and, true. And, and, and people were coming out, you know, um, singing songs about Jesus. Or you had the Pointer Sisters and others who were actual classical, yeah. you know, gospel types. That was real big. And you can see a lot of songs with God in them, a lot of them. But then what happened is the excess came in. And before you know it, people are saying, I don't want any part of that. Man, yeah. those guys are weird. Yes. The second thing that I think brought a quenching to the movement was when politics began to infiltrate the church. Jerry Falwell, with his organization, uh, the silent majority, began to want to capitalize on the movement no of believers. Way. Yeah, and brought in the conservative, because Christians are conservative, right. brought in that wing of the party for the Republicans and began to push a lot of, you guys have a voice, you're the majority, yes. you need to speak out. And what happened is many began to forget that the answer isn't a Republican or Democrat or independent president. The answer is Christ. Yes. And the Jesus movement began to be stifled 
because we thought we could vote righteousness in and we could begin to show our strength and who we are and we gave in to the the pride of this world you know all satan satan tried to offer that to jesus he says all you need to do is bow down to me and i'll give you everything it's mine to give and the church began to and i'm not accusing jerry of that jerry was a, a godly man yeah. but i think that his voice was one that people began to twist away from the preaching of the gospel and remember the Jesus movement was a was a hippie movement that was pure. It really was. That's what revival is. It was very, very pure. But J Jerry came from a Baptist background. It was a denominational church. It's what we didn't want part of. Yeah. We didn't want that. We wanted the freedom of God under the Bible and things like that. Before you know it, we're being drawn into a denominational way of doing church again. And, and it started quenching the Holy Spirit. And even to this day... We have people who are better at preaching Trump than they are Christ. And mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. I think, is a real problem yeah. because people will point at the, the, uh, the uh, message and they don't see Jesus in it anymore. Mm -hmm. And that, Ryan, that, that, and I think what has happened is a lot of the young people have grown up in that environment and they're saying there's got to be something tangible and real. And so you and others like you, but you especially, uh, Ryan, to be honest with you, you'll step into that, into that void and you'll say, this is, you're lonely, you're hurt, you're depressed because you don't have God. Mm -hmm. See, that was the Jesus movement. Yeah. That's how it worked. It still does. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so from that point, the, when did the church start expanding? Because you, when did you start a church? Like how, because you got, everyone was in Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, right? Yeah, yeah. And then when did that? From the like beginning, within, within a year or two, there were guys like McIntosh okay. who stepped out, you know, um, others like him. He was an evangelist and yeah. teacher? Yeah, he would drive from uh, Orange County to San Diego. Uh -huh. And he did that like for a year and he had a Bible study going because... Uh, people needed that, and so th like that. And there were other fledgling churches yeah. that began to. Your dad, uh, in the in mid 70s, yeah. he had his church, and mm -hmm. we had a handful. I mean, there weren't that many mm -hmm. because it was organic. It wasn't something that Chuck said, We need. We need to multiply. It yeah. just happened. It was yeah. organic, you yeah. know. Now, I live in, you know, West Covina, and I can't be driving to Orange County every week. We need something like that here. That's how that works. Yeah, yeah. You know, they went to Arroyo Grande. They they went to uh, uh, Redlands and with Don McClure and others. So there were guys who were saying, uh, we need this where we're at. And it, it was very, very organic. That's how that worked. So now you're in Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. What um what's God doing with you now? Because we have like five minutes left. What's so what's what's going on in your head? What what are you what are you praying for? What do you want to see happen? Um, well, I'm I'm getting to the age where I have to begin to think that there may be somebody who's going to step in and take over mm -hmm. and move on. You know, I told Pastor Chuck uh, one day, I said, you know, Chuck, you've taught me a lot of good things, but one thing you never taught me was how to step out of ministry. <laughs> he, For Because he huh? never did. You know, he was preparing his message that he was going to give when he died. I know. I mean, he was busy at, he kept his hand to that plow and he kept on. But I told him, I said, you've taught me a lot of good things, but you never taught me how to step out and when to do that. Yeah. And I, so I, I'm in that process right yeah. now of asking the Lord, at what point do you have me stepping out of my pastoral uh, role so I can continue with the uh, the uh, council duties that I have in the Calvary Chapel Council? Yeah, because I want to be free to go and minister to other pastors and yeah, you have a lot of wisdom like to, to, for younger guys to, to a lot of deal. experience that I'd like yes. to share with young guys and stuff. Definitely. So that's that's kind of where I'm at right now, Ryan. I'm thinking, what what is the Lord's timeline on me? Who would be the person that could step in my pulpit one day, take over the church, and move it on into the uh -huh. future until Christ comes? That's one thing. A second thing is we're spending time right now developing our men's ministry uh -huh. because I really believe that the church needs male leadership, you know. And there's so much confusion right now concerning the role of women in the church and all of that. Yeah. I'm concentrating on men's ministry. We're going to have a men's uh, campus minutes we're going to we're calling it we're calling it a campus retreat and we're going to have it in november the first and the second you know tony clark's going to be there west bentley's going to be there a guy named rocky said is going to be there i'm going to teach on a friday so it's a friday and a saturday so we're trying to reach the men and 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 develop male leadership because i believe that the feminist movement to be honest mm -hmm. with you has uh, emasculated a lot of men they're afraid to lead they're afraid they don't know how to 
You know, and, and I think that we've got a lot of women who think they're pastors today who are not. The Bible doesn't teach that a woman can be, but they're arguing that they can because they think that's a fruit of feminism right now. Mm -hmm. We can do anything a man can do, yeah. that kind of thing. And they're, they're getting away from the Bible. So I'm concentrating right now on, on raising up men leaders. I'm mentoring young men every two weeks after uh, our, our final service on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I'm meeting with a group of 20 to 30 guys or, or more uh, for an hour and a half answering questions and ministering to them to mentor them for the future. Um, we're just keeping busy, you know, just yeah. trying to reach out, continuing to reach out. That's amazing. You know, there's a, there's a statistic from Barna, Barna Group he said that uh, we're, we're living in uh, the fatherless generation. Yes. Just in California, 50% of the students in schools come from broken homes. Yeah. 50%. Yes. yes. And the father is like, well, if they're coming from a broken home, let's just face the facts. The father is somewhere or the mother's somewhere, but majority is the father's leaving. And then the mom's working full time to provide for the family. That's right. So the kid's just getting, he has no one to mentor. He's just getting raised off That's right. social media That's right. and the streets and, and the neighborhood, basically. That's right. Absolutely. So the men have to, we have to step it up and, and show what it means to lead because... Again, you have this whole feminist movement, everything else that's going on in social media, just completely uh, derailing what a man is supposed to do. Yeah, men don't know what to do. They don't know. And I've told my church, I can't teach you macho 101 classes. Yeah. You, know, you got to learn from scripture and, and you need to have uh, examples. And if you don't have a dad at home that can be that yeah. example, you're, 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 you're really up, uh, yeah, you're going to have a difficult They've time. They've really been making men like sissies. A lot. It's, oh yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's pretty. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on the show. It was awesome. My blessing. We'll do it again. I'd love to talk about uh, some other awesome things that are happening. All right, listeners, tune in. Get the Whosoever's app. Download it. Everything's for free. Our high schools are on there. Um, our tour dates right now. We're going to Colombia, Chile. Uh, where else? Um, we're oh Iceland. I come, dude, you know how long it took me to get in contact with Iceland? <laughs> no. Because basically every church, I have a couple minutes left, every church on Iceland is government. So when you're born, you're just identified into a church and uh -huh. the government pays for the churches. So they got these amazing churches, but literally people are just going to becoming priests because it's a good paying job. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's like, God is dead there. Wow. It's the most uh, godless country in the world. So I finally made contact with the church that actually believes in Genesis, the revelations. Mm. And we are pro we're in the process of going there to do some serious outreaches. <laughs> I'm blessed. So yeah, we're touring. Keep us in prayer. If you guys um, love what we're doing and if you feel led to, to pray for us or do donate to the whosoever's uh, kill the noise school, school tour, Feel free. We love you guys. And um, yeah, I guess next week we'll be talking to you guys about some other rad things. Love you guys and talk to you soon. A 15-year-old living today gathers as much information in one day as a 15-year-old would gather 80 years ago in one year. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I love what Jesus says. The harvest is ripe, the workers are few. Here we are. This has been Live with Ryan Reese. To connect or find out more about Ryan, click on ryan-reese.com. Check us out next Saturday at 9 p.m. for Live with Ryan Reese.